Tonight's speaker is um, Dean uh, Nurgis Mavalvala from the uh, Department of Physics, and she is the uh, also the dean of the school for of the dean of the School of Science, uh, first woman to hold that position in MIT's history. But of course, she's and uh, and before that, um, you know, she comes to that from the from a long background of working in uh, gravitational waves and physics. Uh, she was born in, uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, grew up in Karachi, and uh, spent a lot of time, I understand, repairing, repairing her bike, and uh, was encouraged um, to apply to college overseas by her parents. She graduated from Wellesley College with a bachelor's in physics and astronomy, and came to MIT for her PhD in physics. With, uh, she, her advisor, uh, Rainier Weiss, is now a professor emeritus. And she helped, uh, she helped Weiss to build an early prototype of the gravitational wave detector that would eventually become uh, LIGO, which I think we've all, uh, which would go on to um, make the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And of course, win the, uh, with the Nobel Prize in 2017. Uh, Dean Mavalvala uh, went on to Caltech in 1997 for a postdoc, looking at a cosmic microwave background, and then came back uh, or joined the LIGO laboratory in 2000 as a staff scientist. Um, she went, in uh, 2002, she came back to MIT uh, as an assistant professor of physics. And since then she's been uh, yeah, um, a, no, a noted leader in the department and has a very long list of awards, <laughs> um, and uh, including the, um, the MacArthur Fellowship in 2010, Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics as part of the LIGO team. She's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and has been honored uh, by the Carnegie Corporation of New York as a great immigrant. Also the first recipient of the Lahore Technology Award given by the Information Technology University, Public University of Pakistan. So I think with that, um, I will just hand it over to Dean Mavalvala and she can uh, start her presentation. Oh, and before I forget, any questions during, uh, during her presentation, please put them into the Q&A uh, box and we will answer them all at the end of, of the talk. Uh, any other questions, any other, Technical issues, just send something to me privately in the chat. So, thank you, uh, Dean Mavalvala. Uh, so, so thank you very much, Megan. Um, I've, uh, and thank you all for being here. This is one, this is one of these uh, strange um, experiences of the COVID era to do these kinds of events over Zoom. Uh, the plus is that many more people can attend. The minus is that uh, I don't get to see uh, you all. Uh, and as, a, as someone who, you know, as an instructor, that that's uh, kind of a little awkward. But I'm glad you all are here. I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of uh, the discovery of gravitational waves. And I'm going to go um, a, a fair ways beyond those first discoveries, because a lot has happened since 2016 when we first announced uh, that gravitational waves had been detected by LIGO. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I the title of my talk is "Opening a New Window into the Universe with Gravitational Waves," and that, that's a pretty bold claim. And I hope by by the end of, uh, of, of this time we'll spend together, I will have convinced you that indeed this is actually really the birth of a new field that uh, we are witnessing right now. Um, before I go too far, uh, much farther along, I have to, to, uh, uh, to tell you that the, much of the, uh, the, the data that I will show you uh, is the work of literally uh, over a thousand scientists who belong to the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. Um, and so I acknowledge my colleagues as, as well uh, tonight. Um, now, when you open a new window into the universe, it's a fair question to ask, what's the old window into the universe? Uh, and that would be cosmic light. So for millennia, humans have stared into, uh, into the sky and, uh, and 
observed uh, you know, light basically initially from stars and reflected off, off, off objects in our, our uh, uh, solar system. And in time with more and more powerful instruments looking out all the way to the edge of the universe. So if you look at into the universe with light, you might see an object like this. You, and this is a supernova remnant. This particular one is, is, is uh, Cassiopeia A. Uh, and I'm very fond of this particular uh, uh, picture uh, in, from uh, you know, telescopes for a few reasons. One is it's actually a composite uh, uh, observation from three of, of the great space telescopes. So uh, if you look at the, the, the reddish colors, those are uh, infrared radiation from the Spitzer Space Telescope. The yellows and greens are, are visible light, and that's uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. And then finally, if you look at sort of the blues and purples, those are the uh, Chandra X-ray uh, Observatory, uh, which much of which was, by the way, built at MIT. Um, so uh, so that's one thing, to, uh, the first thing to notice when you look at, uh, at an object in the sky with different colors uh, of light, um, you see different things. And one of the first, uh, one of the things that I'd really point your attention to is at the very center of uh, the picture right here, if you can follow my cursor, you'll see a little blue dot. Okay, so what is this object? The little blue dot is a neutron star. And this neutron star is the remnant that was left over when the parent star that, uh, that uh, this picture shows exploded as a supernova. So many stars, uh, including our you know, stars of, of sort of like our own sun, eventually when they run out of the nuclear fuel that they burn to shine, uh, they actually, uh, the pressure from the photons going outwards shuts off, no more light. And as a result, the gravity, uh, uh, the self-gravity of the star uh, pulls it, uh, it's, uh, it makes it collapse. And in that collapse, there is an, there is an, an explosion and a shock. And these are the ejecta that you see that were uh, pushed out. Now, uh, at the very center, the little neutron star that's left over is the new star that's formed. It's the remnant of this parent system. Now, if the parent star is about the mass of our sun or maybe two times the mass of our sun, a neutron star will form. If it's heavier than that, if it's a few times the mass of our sun, five, six, seven, eight or more, um, that object will collapse to a black hole. So now we might ask, how would we see a black hole if indeed it were a black hole? Um, and the, the truth is for most black holes, unless they're living in some kind of environment of gas and dust, they give off no light. And so you have to look for a different messenger and there enters gravity's messenger. So what is gravity's messenger? Uh, uh, our story of gravity starts with um, uh, Isaac Newton in the 17th century. And Newton gave us this universal law of gravitation. And all of you have at some point or the other taken 801 or the equivalent, and you learned about Newton's law. It was actually a very successful universal law, it was even called, where, uh, and it was one of the first instances of quantifying an observation of, of a natural phenomenon. And Newton said, well, if you have two objects of mass M1 and M2, uh, they experience a, a, a mutual force or gravitation that's proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distances. Now, Newton himself worried about, about something which all actually precedes uh, and predates Newton, and uh, even, even Aristotle worried about this. And that was this question of action at a distance, which is how does mass one know about mass two? Uh, and this question was not answered until our next hero of gravity, which was Einstein in the, uh, uh, in the um, uh, 20th, uh, early 20th century with his theory of uh, general relativity. And Einstein told us, well, gravity is not really a force. Gravity is actually a manifestation of geometry. Gravity is the warpage of space-time, and you've all seen these famous pictures of, of, you, of how you can take a grid on empty space, and if you put a massive object uh, in, in that region of space, the grid will deform, and in fact, if that massive object is a black hole, the grid will turn very much into a, in, into a very pointy funnel. 
Now, Einstein also wrote an equation, which I've also shown here, uh, and it looks almost as innocuous as, 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 as Newton's equation, but it turns out to be one of the most difficult uh, equations to solve. And in fact, it has taken the better part of a century to get exact solutions to the Einstein equations, even for uh, relatively simple systems. Now, there was another thing that came out of Einstein's theory of gravity, which Einstein himself was very uncomfortable about. We, he asked the question, what if the mass of object is not stationary or static, but in fact accelerating? And then out of his equations popped the, uh, a wave, a, indeed a gravitational wave is what it, it was called. So here is a, 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 a picture of warpage of space time. And in fact, if the object were accelerating, as in this picture, which is a, which is a sort of artist uh, uh, depiction of two neutron stars orbiting each other or two black holes orbiting each other, where you have extreme gravitational uh, uh, potentials, then space-time would ripple. And in fact, these waves would, would uh, uh, emanate outwards from the source, traveling at the speed of light. That's what Einstein's equations told him already by 1916. Now, Einstein was very ambivalent about this idea, even though he had this complete mathematical framework in which he described gravity, which he developed between 1915 and 1918. Uh, and in fact, in 1918, Schwarzschild uh, proposed, uh, using Einstein's uh, uh, ideas, proposed that stars, there could be stars with so much mass in such a small volume that even light can't escape their, their gravitational pull. Einstein did not like these dark stars. That's what they were called at the time, which we, what we today know as, as black holes. And in fact, Einstein remained quite uncertain about gravitational waves themselves uh, in, 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 throughout his career. And, and indeed in 1936, he actually submitted a, a, a paper in which he retracted uh, the, their existence. That the title of the paper was Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And if you read the abstract very quickly, you learn that they're, they're arguing, no, they don't exist. Uh, and then in a, through discussion with, with Robertson and others, he, they, he retracted the retraction. And so you can see that there was this, this great ambivalence uh, that he had uh, uh, about it. And the doubts and controversy is it didn't subside until the late 1950s uh, through the work of many others, whether gravitational waves really do, uh, do exist. Uh, but I will say that this with, with, you know, sort of with some, some humility that indeed, no matter how beautiful a theory Einstein had and how well he, he proposed mathematically that these gravitational waves were there, in the end, it is always experiment and observation that have the final say. And those experiments and observations had, uh, you know, came about initially uh, in the form of neutron stars, which I've already told you a little bit about. These are stars about the mass of our, our, our sun, about a solar mass or a, or a little bit more, uh, that have a, a radius of about 10 kilometers. So they're absurdly uh, uh, gravitational uh, objects. So uh, compared to our own Earth, which has its uh, uh, an Earth, uh, uh, our own sun rather, which has an a solar mass in, in a, um, a radius of about 700,000 kilometers. So uh, these are very gravitationally compact objects. These were proposed in 1934 by Body and Swicky. Uh, the rotating neutron stars, uh, which are also known as pulsars, were proposed in 1967 by, by Pitini and Gold. And, and these are uh, one of the, the, the properties of these neutron stars is when they, they, they spin up about their own axes, they generate very, very strong magnetic fields, which causes the light that they emit to be strongly beamed, like, like lighthouse beams. Now, at the same year, in 1967, the first pulsar was observed by uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell and, and Hewish. Um, in 1969, this man, Joe Weber, sets the world on fire by, at least the scientific world on fire, by announcing the first detection of gravitational waves using this device. This is this device that I, that I show here. So it's basically a big chunk of, of metal, in the, in the first instances, aluminum, 
uh, uh, about a ton of aluminum, and it's outfitted with very sensitive uh, motion sensors or, or position sensors. And what these these the, the this device does is, if a gravitational wave passes through this chunk of metal, it it sets its normal modes to ring, and these very sensitive uh, uh, transducers pick up this motion. And Weber, um, using this device, claimed he had detected gravitational waves. Now it turned out. To, to be an incorrect claim, and and that was that was you know falsified over the the coming hand for you know few years already by the mid 70s people were pretty convinced this this was an incorrect uh, claim, but it did sort of set into motion the idea that if you have neutron stars they're dense enough that they should be able to emit these gravitational waves with strengths that you have some chance of seeing. Now, the first black hole was discovered in 1971. So again, here's another highly gravitational object that should radiate gravitational waves. Um, but the, uh, the, the real sort of um, nail in, in the coffin of gravitational waves not existing came from the observation of a binary pulsar system that was observed in 1974 by House and Taylor. And what they showed on it was shown on this graphic is an, you know, as a function of, of the year. So they started their measurements in 1974. What this is, is it's a pair of neutron stars where one of the neutron stars is a pulsar. And I told you pulsars are nature's lighthouses. So by counting the timing of the, the lighthouse beam crossing our line of sight here on the Earth using radio telescopes, they were able to show that the these two objects, their orbit was shrinking. They were getting closer to each other. And that's what's shown on the vertical axis. And the reason they do that is that these objects are gravitationally uh, strong, uh, you know, compact enough that they're radiating away gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are carrying away energy. Now, where does that energy come from? The energy comes from the orbit. And as a result, the objects are getting closer and closer to each other. And as they do that, they'll spin faster and faster, and eventually they'll collide. Now, the object that that, um, um, uh, that Hulse and Taylor saw is still early enough in its evolution that it won't collide for another 100 million years. But what they did do is that they measured that the orbit was shrinking. And that's what the data points show. And then the, the solid curve is an exact prediction of general relativity for the parameters of their system. It is not a fit. It is really taking the parameters of their system, plugging it into a, an approximation for the Einstein equations. And this, of course, was recognized with a Nobel Prize in 1993. So by then, people understood that gravitational waves do exist. They are radiated by these compact systems. Now, Einstein's ambivalence, ambivalence was justified because the first observational evidence for neutron stars and black holes didn't come in his lifetime. He actually died in 1955. So the, one of the most remarkable things to me when I look back at this history is that even though he was so ambivalent about it, his theory, the, the, the equations he wrote down made very firm predictions about gravity, about space time, about black holes. So now we fast forward to about 2006. And for the first time, using you know, supercomputers and, and, and you know, sort of the, the newfound computational um, uh, power that, that humans had developed, there were the first exact solutions to the Einstein equations. And so this movie I'm going to show you is a simulation uh, of one of, uh, uh, you know, one of these uh, 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 is actually a, a video of one of these simulations. And what you'll see is a pair of black holes that are orbiting each other. They're getting closer and closer as they radiate gravitational waves and eventually they'll collide. And on the bottom over here, you'll see a you'll see the, how the, the, the signal accumulates. So let me run the movie. And here you go. You see that the two black holes are are uh, are orbiting each other, and we're going to zoom in. And initially, you just see the space time is deformed. This is a two dimensional cut of this of the space, and then the color coding is is uh, is the time. Uh, and what you see is uh, uh, the, just the the standard old funnels under each black hole. Uh, but eventually, as they orbit and get closer and closer to each other, and you can see the gravitational waves are being radiated. Those are the, the purple ripples going out uh, outwards. 
uh, eventually their, the, the space time uh, in, in their vicinity gets extremely warped. And indeed, when the horizons of the two black holes touch, you see sort of the maximum amplitude of the wave down below. And you also see the maximum deformation of the space time in, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the movie. Once the two, two black holes have collided, they, they form a single black hole that well, it ha you know, wobbles for a little bit, and then it goes quiet. And typically, you know, that pair of black holes forms a new black hole, which will, will never be heard from again. That's, the, 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 um, that's what Einstein's uh, uh, theory tells us. And you can see this is an enormous collaboration uh, to, to get to this point of being able to solve the Einstein equations exactly for this simple black hole system. Oh, now, it wasn't always that easy. If you go back to the late 1960s, remember this is the time when neutron stars and black holes were were being were being discovered. Uh, this man, Kip Thorne, who was then a, a new faculty member at, at, at Caltech, was one of the first people to put a scale on how big of a signal could you expect in gravitational waves uh, from a pair of neutron stars in a in a galaxy not too far from our own, so sort of in the next cluster of galaxies to our own. And the scale Kip Thorne put on this was that the amplitude of the wave, so the first of all, the shape of the wave would be this chirp waveform. It's, it's increasing in, in, in frequency and amplitude as time goes by, and it's called a chirp because that's pretty much what, uh, what the waveform of, of, of uh, a bird chirping is. It sort of starts off with low frequency and then um, uh, goes to higher frequency and higher amplitude. Um, and the scale he put on that was 10 to the minus 21. And this is called a strain because gravitational waves actually are measured in terms, in, in terms of the change in length per length of some region of space time. I'll say a little bit more about that in, a, in just a short bit. Now, at the same time, there was also the question of detecting gravitational waves. Remember, Weber had already made the claim by 1969, and people were really thinking hard about how these might be detectable. And to really detect them, you have to understand what do they do in the first place? What do they do here on the Earth far away from their, their, their sources? So Einstein's general relativity tells us they're ripples of the space-time itself. They travel at the speed of light. And then very importantly for our purposes, it also tells us that the gravitational waves stress and uh, stretch and compress spacetime itself. And what that really means is that as they travel through a region of spacetime uh, of space, they're making and if you it, they're changing the distances between uh, objects uh, at the frequency of the wave that's passing by. So if you take two um, massive objects, you separate them by some distance L, then a gravitational wave of amplitude H will change that distance by an amount uh, delta L. And now remember Kip Thorne had already kind of given us the scaling that for a typical pair of neutron stars not too far away, that a, you know, this amplitude H was gonna be 10 to the minus 21. So if you took an object of about a meter, take a person, you know, for a, a B, for example, and an object, a uh, space-time object of height 1.6 meters, my height would change by 10 to the minus 21 meters if the gravitational wave went through me. That's the, the scale of, of, of the detection challenge. That's what you would have to detect. Now, around the same time, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, the, uh, this man, Ray Weiss, was uh, then a professor um, uh, uh, at MIT, now Professor Emeritus, and he was thinking hard about how one might detect gravitational waves, and he was among the first to propose uh, an interferometer to do it, not those, those big chunks of metal called bars that Weber used, they were, those are not sensitive enough, but in fact, to use an, uh, an, an, an interferometer. Uh, and you can see from this, this uh, animation here, what the interferometer does is you have uh, a, a laser on the left. It shoots laser uh, light that's split in, along two arms by this beam splitter at the center. Two mirrors at the ends reflect the light. And then depending on, where, on the path length difference between the two paths of the light, you either get constructive interference destructive interference and everything in, in else in between. So you can, at the output, measure all the light, none of the light, 
or small changes in the amount of light that you measure. Now that was already um, you know, a, a, a great idea, but Weiss also understood something else that was very important at the time. He understood that you could not make these interferometers just be laboratory size, a meter scale size, because then they would have to measure path length differences of 10 to the minus 21 meters. And that was pretty, pretty um, impossible to contemplate. So what he proposed instead was make the detector long, make it four kilometers long, and then you have to measure path length differences of only 10 to the minus 18 meters, only about a thousand times smaller than a single proton. And that he said already in 1972, that we can do. And he actually uh, wrote a very famous unpublished paper in which he showed us how to do it. And, and you know, 30 years later, uh, the community more or less built the device that he designed in 1972. <laughs> So uh, in, in 1975, Kip Thorne and, and Ray Weiss met somewhat by accident, uh, and they conjured up the idea of LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And then they spent the next 15 years uh, uh, sort of advocating for it, doing experiments to, and, and theory to, to prove to, to the scientific community that it had a, ch a chance of working. Uh, and eventually LIGO was, was funded in, in the uh, early 1990s, built over the 1990s and began operating in early 2000s. So how does LIGO work? These are two, uh, you know, there, there are two LIGO uh, uh, detectors, one in Washington state, east of Seattle, and one in Louisiana, about halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And the principles of these are, are you really have to do two things to make a gravitational wave detection. And I'm going to simplify this, but there's really just those two things and then all kinds of technologies to make those two things happen. The first thing you have to do is you have to make the mirrors of the, of the, of the nephrometer really, really still. You have to shield them from all terrestrial forces so that their motion is dominated by the passing gravitational wave. So what do you have to do? Well, if you just took a mirror and you put it in an ordinary kind of kind of you know environment of a, of a lab somewhere or a room, it would move by off order of a fraction of a micron to a micron, depending on what frequency you're measuring at. And that's 10 to the minus six meters. Remember the gravitational wave is going to want to displace the mirrors by 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's your first factor of a trillion. You have to shield the, the, the mirror from external forces by a factor of a trillion. And that's done by using uh, sophisticated vibration isolation systems um, uh, uh, and then also by hanging the mirror uh, as from a cascade of pendula. It turns out that that pendula you all might have learned in, 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 in again uh, in, in your early um, uh, physics classes or even in your engineering classes, uh, when you when you suspend something from a pendulum like you do for, you know, from a, say a bungee cord, um, it actually acts as a, a filter for, for motion at the top of the pendulum. <clears throat> and between those two techniques, you can get the mirror to be still at the level of, 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 of less than 10 to the minus 18 meters around at around 100 hertz. Now you have a really still mirror. And that does you absolutely no good unless you know how to measure such small motions. And in our case, the, 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 the measurement device, the, the ruler, if you will, in LIGO, is the wavelength of the laser light. And there comes your second factor of a trillion. The wavelength of, of the laser light we use is one micron, so 10 to the near infrared, 10 to the minus six meters. And we're trying to resolve motion of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So this is equivalent of saying we are trying to make a measurement that's a trillion times finer than the spacing of the tick marks on our ruler. And so how do you do that? The way you do that is you do that by use averaging over many, many measurements. And that's equivalent of saying using a lot of laser power. And if you go back to the, the picture in your mind of an interferometer and the output being all of the light or none of the light and everything in between tells you the mo how much the mirrors move, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to make a, a resolve 
having no light coming out and having the tiniest bit of light coming out. And what's that resolution? That's what limits us. And so using a lot of laser light so that you can average over the fluctuations in the number of photons, because laser light is, is a Poisson a light source, distributed light source. So if you use n number of photons, the fluctuations are square root of n, and that would tell you to use a lot of photons. And in the case of LIGO, we use um, a, a very high power laser. And eventually, by the time the, all of the, the light is set up in the interferometer, we have almost a megawatt of light circulating in there. And those are the two things that let you make this measurement at the precision that we need. Now, the LIGO was funded over many decades in the US by the National Science Foundation. And this man, Barry Barish, uh, also a faculty member at Caltech, uh, joined the collaboration in 1994 and is credited with uh, 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 leading the building of the LIGO observatories. <laughs> Uh, LIGO is one of a global network of detectors, the, the, the two LIGO detectors in the US. The next longest detector that is operational is a three kilometer long detector called Virgo uh, in Europe. It's, in, it's a French-Italian collaboration in Italy. Uh, uh, there's also a three kilometer long detector uh, called Kagura that's, uh, that's uh, being commissioned in, uh, in Japan. Uh, and then there's plans for a future detector in, in India and all also for a space detector, uh, a space observatory called LISA. Now, again, we fast forward to uh, uh, September 14, 2015, and that was the day that the two LIGO detectors in Washington and Louisiana registered the first confirmed signal uh, that uh, associated with, uh, um, with um, the collision of black holes. And this is this iconic signal that you, by now most people who follow this have, have seen in some form or the other. Um, what you see is on the vertical scale is the amplitude of the waves uh, in, in, uh, or strain. And on the horizontal axis is, the, is time. And this is that chirp waveform that Kip Thorne had drawn already in 1967. Um, and the, there's a few things to notice about this. The first thing to notice is uh, that at the time that the that the two black holes collided, which is this, the maximum in, in, in the amplitude of the signal, that corresponds to a strain of 10 to the minus 21. And that's an enormous check mark for Kip Thorne. He told us this uh, to, uh, you know, predicted this um, um, as the target um, strain that we would be able to measure you know, you know, decades earlier. Now, if you uh, ask how much were the mirrors of LIGO moving when we when we made this measurement? They were moving by a few times, 10 to the minus 18 meters, and that's an enormous check mark for Ray Weiss, who actually showed us how to build a detector that would be capable of measuring this, also in the early 1970s. Now, what does this signal tell us? Well, it if you uh, this is now showing the same exact signal, but this is showing the, the, the best fit model uh, that's constructed from, um, uh, from uh, uh, you know, numerical relativity, which, was, which are those, those solutions to the Einstein equations. Now, very, uh, just to give you an idea of how you do any astrophysics with a signal like this, um, it turns out that by looking at how the frequency changes, so the rate of change of frequency of the signal gives you the masses of the black holes involved. Once you know those, the amplitude of the, the wave gives you how far the object is. It gives you the distance to the source. And then finally, when you look at the, this decay of the final, uh, the black hole that's formed, and you look at the decay of the signal, the frequency and, and decay time give you the mass and spin of the, the newly formed final black hole. And when you put that all together, you create a story like this one. So here are two black holes. In this instance, uh, they are put into a star field so you can see how they actually deform the space time around them, including these bright rings that you'll see uh, form at the edges of the, of the black hole, which are light that's bent from behind the black hole and forms a ring around it. Uh, this particular simulation was also used in the movie Interstellar. So you can see two black holes form a single black hole. And what we learned was that once upon a time, 
1.3 billion years ago, there were two black holes. They collided as, as Einstein had instructed them to do. And their properties were that the two parent black holes were about 30 times the mass of our sun. At the time that these 30 solar mass black holes collided, they were moving at half the speed of light. So you have to pause there for a moment and just imagine in your minds what that means. 30 solar mass objects moving at nearly the speed of light. They're 1.3 billion light years away. And remarkably, the new black hole that was formed was three solar masses lighter than the, the parents. So three times the mass of our sun was radiated away in gravitational waves in those 200 milliseconds uh, uh, at, uh, in, in, their, in their collision. And this is it, it believed to be the, the highest uh, 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 power uh, collision that was seen at the time. Since then, we've seen more powerful ones, but at the time. Uh, what you can tell is that the two black holes did not live happily ever after. Uh, this discovery was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017 to the founders of the field, Ray Weiss, who taught us how to build the instrument, Kip Thorne, who uh, uh, taught us how to understand the astrophysics and what we expected to see, and Barry Barish, who's credited with building the observatories. But a single discovery doesn't mean we've opened a new window into the universe. It means we've made a spectacular discovery. We've confirmed Einstein was right. We've seen black holes uh, you know, collide in real time for the first time. But is it really opening a new window into the universe? Well, it turns out that advanced LIGO is, 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 uh, is um, runs in a, in a, at the cadence uh, of doing about a, a, an observing run every other year. And in between doing observing runs, we make instrumental improvements. And so here then is, is the story of what we've seen so far. In observing run one, we measured that first and famous black hole I just told you about. And we also confirmed two more binary black holes. In observing run two, which occurred about a year later, we had two important things happen. One was that the LIGO detectors joined the Virgo, uh, sorry, the Virgo detectors joined the LIGO detectors uh, for the first time. And in that observing run, we saw seven more binary black holes and we saw for the first time a binary neutron star event. And in those two observing runs, we were observing roughly one astrophysical event per month of observation. And you can see that from the, from the, um, from the plot on the right. By observing round three, which, which occurred, you know, we had a, 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 a little under two year shutdown for major upgrades. And by observing round three, we were actually observing more than one event per week. So you can see the, the plot on the right shows the, the, uh, the cumulative event rate uh, as, uh, as the number of days that go by from observing round one onwards. And you can see a, a sharp rise in, in in the rate of observations because of improvements to the sensitivity uh, of the detector. So in observing run one and two, here was the here was here sort of the uh, a snapshot of, of what we saw. And at the time, the, the, the very first one we saw that I already described is, is on the left. We saw nine other binary black hole um, uh, collisions, and from the, the waveform, we could tell how far they are, how heavy they are, were they spinning. Uh, and then by partnering with, with Virgo, because we have three detectors, you can use triangulation to localize the, the, the uh, uh, source in the sky. Otherwise, gravitational wave detectors are not very di directional. And so you can see on the bottom left at the time, you know, uh, this uh, GW170818, which simply the, the numbers simply tell you the day on which they were observed uh, was the best localized. And then on the very right, you see a dramatically different event. And what's different about this is this was the first binary neutron star. And you notice right away the time scale. Every one of the other binary black hole uh, collisions that I show you where the time scale is, is a fraction of a second. Typically, uh, this whole span is about a tenth of a second. Whereas on the very right, when we saw the binary neutron star, the signal lasted in our detection band for over a minute. And that immediately told us it's much lighter. 
in mass and therefore very likely to be a neutron star. Now, neutron stars are inherently different from black holes, not just because they are lighter, but because they're made of neutrons. And when neutrons are smashed together, you get a spectacular light show. So this is now the story of seeing gravitational waves and light together from this object GW170817. So LIGO and Virgo see a, this neutron star collision. About 1.7 seconds later, the, a gamma ray observatory, the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory sees a, a, a gamma ray event. And this then sort of um, triggers a lot of excitement that this could possibly be uh, something that could be seen by other telescopes. Light could be seen by other telescopes. Now, it turns out that when LIGO uh, made, and Virgo made the detection, uh, we localized the source to this yellow um, um, patch in the sky, about 30 square degrees, which happens to be in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and at the time that we made the, the detection, it was daytime in the southern hemisphere. So the astronomy community, we sent out an alert, and the astronomy community had roughly uh, uh, 12 hours to prepare to search for something in this 30 square degree patch of sky. And then what followed was an astronomer's night to remember. And this is a very busy plot, but I want you to take away only a few things from it. If you look at this left column here, it tells you that in every band that we looked, we saw something. We saw gravitational waves. We saw gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, radio. At all different wavelengths at different times in the, in the hours and days that follow, an object lit up in the sky. So on the bottom of this panel, you see this field of view and all of the field of view of all these different telescopes, which are named on the top left corner of each, each, each block, were staring at the galaxy NGC 4993. And you can see there's a crosshair on each of these, these uh, panels that's pointing to a little uh, lit up dot. Now, that was these were measured 10, 11, 12 hours after the LIGO Virgo alert. Some were the Chandra X rays were observed nine days later, for example. But what you see is here is a nice example for, from the telescope DLT 40, where 20 days earlier, look in the crosshairs, there was nothing there. 20 days earlier, those two neutron stars were orbiting each other. They were giving off gravitational waves, but they hadn't collided. They were giving off no light. Now, what you can also do is we could look at the colors of light. Oh, let me just show you. This is kind of fun. Here's two neutron stars orbiting each other, giving off nothing but gravitational waves. And then they'll collide, and then you'll see a, a light show. So I'm going to play it one more time so you can see it without me talking over it. Just what you're going to look for is gravitational waves first. The jet jets are the gammas, and then you see the more isotropic radiation that's that's the uh, mostly visible infrared and then other colors. Okay, so I'll just play it one more time so you can have some fun with it. Oh, if I can do that. There we go. Now, this plot shows the spectrum, the different colors of light that were given off as we measured over, watch on the top right as, as a function of days. So as you put on different filters on your telescope and you look at what colors uh, of, of light are being emitted by this object, you see that it's evolving in time. And these peaks that we see were actually associated 
with the formation of heavy elements in the periodic table. And this is something that's really spectacular to have seen because there has been a long standing mystery here on the earth that we have too much gold. Now you wouldn't believe that given how, what a precious metal it is and how entire civilizations have been you know, lost and, 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 uh, and formed over you know, the, the chase for gold. But it turns out we don't know why we have as much gold as we do because gold and many of the heavier elements like platinum, the lanthanide series, those are very neutron rich nuclei. And it, you know, most many of the elements that we are made of come from the sun, from stars. And it turns out stars can't fuse elements too much, he uh, elements heavier than iron. Those are, it's energetically unfavorable and they're, they're uh, and, and too neutron rich. So it has long been thought that to create the truly, so another alternative is that, that there are some elements that would be be formed, the heavier elements might be formed in supernova collisions like the one I showed you as I opened my talk. And that doesn't account for in, enough of it either. So it has long been hypothesized that neutron stars must be involved in making these neutron rich uh, 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 heavy elements. And, and indeed those spectra that I showed you as that were changing as a function of time have confirmed that those lines were lines associated with gold and the heavier elements. And now we have seen for the first time evidence that these heavy elements are formed in the collisions or mergers of neutron stars. And what this periodic table shows is, is the, the, the abundance of an element formed by a neutron star. So the more yellow uh, uh, the box is, uh, the more of, of the abundance of that element is associated with the, with the neutron star merger. And that came out of uh, 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 this measurement that we made with this neutron star. So again, with a single event, we've been able to observe, you know, to say something important and useful about nature and, and the universe and in indeed about our own selves, because it was long, you know, we've all heard Carl Sagan, you know, you know already in the, you know, decades ago said, you know, we are made of stardust. And I think now it's fair to say we are made of neutron star dust. Now, in the meantime, LIGO and Virgo have made other detections. I'll show you just a couple. So this is on the left is a, as a, as a, 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 a showing the number of, of detections we had from observing run three. Remember I told you in observing run three, we had a dramatic increase. We have had over, uh, over uh, something like 67 uh, uh, um, uh, events that we've seen. And that just shows you what kinds of events we're seeing. The BNS stands for binary neutron stars. We also, they, it is possible to form uh, uh, pairs of, the, uh, of objects where one is a neutron star, one is a black hole. We've seen evidence for that. Oh, we've certainly seen a lot of binary black hole mergers. And then let me draw your attention to the two objects on the right. And so the, the top one is 1905-21. Now this is an intermediate mass black hole and this is a head scratcher for our scientists. Now I should say, even the very first one that we saw where we saw these 30 solar mass black holes was already a head scratcher because we didn't really know how nature would make a 30 solar mass black hole. Because if they're really collapsed from stars as I told you in my opening slide, then stars are, uh, don't grow to be 30 solar masses uh, except if they're extremely old and then they would be you know, in the very distant universe. So, um, so here is another mystery object where we've seen two black holes, a, a 66 and an 85 solar mass black hole collide to form a 142 solar mass black hole. And this is a mystery object because we expect these uh, not to, nature not to be able to form black holes sort of in the range of 50 to 150 solar masses. And it's because in that range of solar masses, you get something called a pair instability. And what that is, is remember the, the, the stars are shining. So photons are holding the star up against its own gravity. But if you get to large enough ma uh, solar mass, uh, the, the photons in the star uh, can, can, can form pairs of electrons and anti-electrons. 
and in fact, and therefore uh, the, uh, the light pressure decreases, the star goes in unstable and, and collapses. Uh, in fact, it explodes and nothing gets left. It just, all the material is blown up. So the fact that you find this 85 solar mass black hole has been a big surprise. It's in something called a mass gap. The lower object is also interesting because we observationally we have reasons to believe that if you have if it's some, if an object is below about two solar masses it's a neutron star but to form a black hole you have to be kind of about five solar masses so what's an object that's in between and that's called the mass gap is it a neutron star or is it a black hole and so these are the kinds of mysteries that we're uncovering. And I, I, I will say, I never tire of saying that one of the most wonderful things about discovery is that you, when you make a discovery, all you've done is you've uncovered the next question to ask. And that's what we're doing right now. So let me just wrap up by saying, look, you know, here's Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. It appears to be true. These waves do travel at the speed of light. We've, you know, we've, we've confirmed their geometry. We've seen black holes exist. We've seen them form in pairs. We also have some mysteries. We don't know how na nature makes such black, heavy black holes. We don't know how they form pairs. We have some ideas about them that we can start to tease out. But those are the kinds of questions uh, that we are grappling with in these uh, in these uh, uh, ideas. So I'm going to skip this part here and go straight to sort of closing out and saying, so, you know, I hope I've convinced you that we really are launching a new era of gravitational wave astrophysics. Look, these are the first direct observations of gravitational waves. They're, they're, they're all, all, you know, we're coming on to order 75, uh, you know, confirmed detections. Um, you know, Einstein's theory of general relativity is confirmed in the dynamical part. This is yet another test of uh, Einstein's general relativity, but it's the first test of, of the dynamical part of it. Binary black holes and neutron star collisions, we're observing them in real time, observing them routinely. And as someone who has spent my whole career building the instrument, it's also really nice that the machine works with the sub atometer precision that it needed. And you know, in some sense, these are not the things will be that will be remembered about this moment in time, but really we've turned on a completely new sense with which we can study uh, the universe. And for the first time, we can use gravity alone, or we can combine it with light as we did for the neutron stars uh, to observe, you know, and make discoveries we haven't even uh, thought of as yet. So I hope you can see this is an exciting new field and you're really observing the birth of the field with these, these discoveries over the last four years. Now, I want to sort of finish out by just telling you a, a little bit about my own story uh, through this journey and, and uh, to, um, to discoveries. And, and I want this to be a story of, of inspiration for how how big science, big discoveries get made, and it takes a lot of detours and a lot of patience. And, and so, you know, my life in science began uh, when I was a, a kid growing up. I, I used to repair bicycles, and mostly because I didn't have uh, the resources to actually pay to, uh, to have them repaired. Uh, and I also had a fantastic chemistry teacher who um, uh, who taught me to make some, you know, who's very adventurous in the lab. Let me just say he himself was a part of a, a student uprising in, in Sri Lanka and, and so knew a lot about, uh, about the, uh, the street cocktails of chemistry for, um, uh, shall I say, protest. Um, I got my first taste of, of, of laboratory le research and when I was an undergraduate at Wellesley and that was the first time I kind of really understood that there are problems in the world that nobody knows the answer to that I could be part of solving because research is basically that process and that was really exciting. Um, and then I met Ray Weiss uh, when I was a uh, starting graduate student at MIT in the early 1990s. And I call it a chance encounter with insanity because when he first told me about LIGO and that we were going, going to try and measure 10 to the minus 18 meters, I thought it was insane. Uh, but I also was really hooked onto the idea. And not just that if we detected gravitational waves, it would really change the way we see the universe. And you know, indeed 25 later, years later we did, 
but also the technology and innovation and, and creativity that goes into building an instrument uh, to, that can reach such precision. So that's how it started. I had lots of, uh, you know, lost path along the way. I know I wasn't sure physics was right for me. It's a lot of things that people, young people do grapple with. And I had many mentors along the way who always propped me up. Um, I then started my own research group at MIT in 2002. And I started working on a series of, of, of quantum technologies that have helped LIGO uh, get to where it is now. And in fact, if you think about observing RAM3 and where we saw that dramatic increase in the event rate, uh, that was largely due to um, a, a quantum technology that was developed in, in, in my group since I came back to MIT as a faculty member. Um, uh, my, the, uh, my, you know, the work that we do was, is the work of so many students and postdocs and we got recognition for it. And I always want to remind people that you know, uh, when people list my awards, I wanna make sure people know that it really takes a village and it's the work of, of very many people. And then, of course, the discoveries of a lifetime. This is a, a picture of, of me uh, hugging uh, with Ray Weiss on the morning that his Nobel uh, Prize was, uh, was uh, uh, announced. And I also want to be sure to make sure people know that uh, you know, a, a life in science does not have to be uh, a, you know, lost in a, in a desert or a lab. Uh, this is my, my, my uh, son. Uh, at the time, he was uh, Three maybe, he's 12 now with Ray Weiss uh, building something in the machine shop. I never show this picture uh, to, the, uh, to the, you know, the occupational safety uh, people, but uh, you know, uh, it's, it's fun to show otherwise. Um, so LIGO itself here is uh, uh, a picture. You can see this is me uh, standing here watching a terrible wildfire that was at the Washington Observatory that was threatening the, uh, uh, the, the observatory uh, coming in from the east. Um, so, you know, it, the fire, it turns out that the, the, the long arms of LIGO acted like a fire break and protected the concrete um, uh, uh, um, housing of the tubes protected the town to, uh, to the east from this uh, uh, fire from spreading further. So LIGO has been useful in other ways. Um, this is a Louisiana Observatory, and if you can see carefully, here's a little row of, uh, 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 marking a, a row of bullets. Uh, early on when LIGO was built in Louisiana, uh, um, it was not always welcome. And this was uh, a, a cartoon that was, was in the local newspaper. It says, it's hunting season time to set the lasers in self-defense mode. Um, in the meantime, um, this is, again, this is a picture of me in the control room at, at, at LIGO uh, when we were st still getting it all going. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, if, if I could describe my work in, in LIGO in, in one graph, it would be this one, which is that I've always been thinking about what is the technology we need five years from now to make LIGO better. So each of these curves, as the curves go lower and lower, we're making a more sensitive instrument. And I've, uh, my group is always thinking about what's the technology that, that will get us there. Um, so here's a picture of, of the MIT LIGO group in 1993. That's me over there. That's Ray Weiss. Um, same group in 2015. That's me over there. And there again is Ray Weiss. And some of the group members are are the say, are are still there as well? It's a group that's you know Ray has formed a, a really a real community and grown a field around him. Um, this is me in the lab. This is me doing the gravitational wave dance with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and this is a picture I really love. This is on the morning of the of the announcement of the first discovery of gravitational waves. And someone got a a picture of me at the press conference sharing an intimate moment with my son. And I was, I was saying something like, I got you kid. And somehow this picture got there. And I really like it because I keep wanting to remind people that you know science and, and family do belong together. Um, this is uh, our trip to Stockholm in 2017. And then finally, I'll, I'll finish my story with, with you know, serving MIT. I was the associate head of the physics department for five years, and this is a picture I love. This is my favorite time of year. These are, uh, this is senior dinner where we're celebrating our graduating seniors. And I just love uh, working with students, which is what the associate department head does. 
Uh, and and since then, I just became dean. I'm in my seventh week of being the dean of the School of Science, and you can see it's a different world. So that's me on, at, at dean's council um, in in a, in a Zoom box. Uh, so I'm going to stop here and just take questions. I, I hope I've I've convinced you that that this is a this is a truly uh, singular moment in the in in the history of gravitational wave science where where it's being born. And that the journey to do it has been a lot of fun and filled with people who who I love and who love me back. So thank you. Thank you. That was uh, that was fascinating. Um, so we've got some questions that have been coming in. So let me just. Uh, that's uh, the questions coming in. Um, let's see some of them. Uh, start with one from uh, Mel Suarez. Um, do we get any colors when looking at supernovae? Uh, yeah, so uh, indeed, if you look at supernovae with light, yes, there are the, you know, all of these, all of these astrophysical processes give off different colors of light, which are associated with the energetics of the system, uh, with the chemistry of what's going on, you know, so, so light and its colors are one of the most important tools for us being able to tease out the, 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 the physics of what's going on in any astrophysical object. Uh, and similarly, the you know the the, the comparable thing is is the wavelength or, or 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 the frequency of the gravitational waves, and that also tells us about what's going on, in, you know, in the, in the in the source that emits them. Another question. Um, so, uh, why did Einstein look at the math? Uh, how it worked out for a distant galaxy? Is it easier to look at a distant galaxy than at, in in our own or in a near galaxy? Yeah, so that's a really uh, th that's a really good question. So really, what it is is it's a question of how many black hole or neutron star mergers are there in any given galaxy. So let me just tell you, in a in a galaxy like our own, a neutron star uh, uh, merges with another neutron star about once every hundred thousand years. So if you could only look at our galaxy, you'd have to wait a hundred thousand years to see a single event. And that's why you have to look at many, many, many galaxies uh, to be able to get your event rate up. And that's why we have to, we're forced. So Kip Thorne, when he did his original calculations, he did them for the next cluster of galaxies closest to our own. And once, as soon as you get to a cluster and you have a few hundreds of galaxies, your event rate goes up. And that's the real reason to, to do that. So nearer would be better because the signal would be stronger. The signal also falls off as one over distance. So, so closer would be better, but then you'd have to, you know, chances of getting an event are rare. Okay. Uh, question from Mads. Uh, the 2015 event took 150 milliseconds. Had you been in the vicinity of the black holes, how long would that same event have appeared to take? And is this something that would have, would have been a million year event from a different perspective? Yeah, so I, I you know, I think the, uh, so you're you're asking about you know what was the uh, so closer in uh, let me think if I can answer this uh, correctly uh, so I don't know the answer off the top of my head but the, of course the signal is redshifted but by very little because even though it's a billion light years away that's actually our local universe by by uh, astronomical standards so it wouldn't the timing wouldn't have been that different if we were closer in. Okay. Yeah. To to really see sort of you know you know so to see sort of the the redshifting effects, you have to go to cosmological scales, and this would be a redshift of about 0.1, which is really hardly cosmological yet. Uh. It fell soft wood. Uh, where do gravity waves go? <laughs> yeah. So you know. Um, they basically, so one of the things that's really incredible about gra gravitational waves is they are, most matter is completely transparent to them. They just pass through everything. And so the way you can think about this is that they pass through our detector, they deposited a tiny amount of energy, very small amount of energy, because you see how little the mirrors move. Yeah. And then they just carry on. 
Uh, you know, so they, you know, it's different than than light waves. When you detect a, a a light wave, you know, you absorb it in your detector and it stops, right? You 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 know, when when the light wave hits your your camera, it that's the end. Whereas gravitational waves kind of go through the detector and carry on, and that's part of why we see that saw them in both detectors as well. You know, at Louisiana and then at at, at in Washington, because it passes through one detector and then the wave just continues on and passes through the next, and then it goes off to the another another corner of the universe. Okay. Um, a question from Kurt Silverman: uh, Any comment on possibility of three bodies colliding versus just two? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. This is a this is very much possible. And in fact, in some of these systems where we don't really fully understand, you know, why the masses are what they are uh, of the objects, it's very likely that these binary systems were formed by three body dynamics and where one of the bodies then got ejected out just for conserving angular momentum. And so, so yes, three-body dynamics is 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 an important piece of this puzzle. Yeah. Um, John Hornstein asks, will uh, will Lisa be able to detect uh, gravitational wave emissions from before the emission of the CMB? No. So let me say a little bit about that because it's really quite fascinating. So um, there, if you look at the early universe, if you look back in time, you know, which uh, uh, you uh, to the beginnings of the universe, the earliest time that we can see back in time is when the universe is 400,000 years old, and that's with light. So what was going on? So you have the Big Bang, and now the universe is, is hot and dense, and it's compact. And so it's filled with all of matter and energy is in this small volume. And so you have photons and you know particles that, as, as we know gravitational waves everything is is in there, but photons it turns out are very um, are 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 very interactive. Uh, they and what what that means is when they meet matter if they meet an electron they scatter off the electron they get absorbed. Gravitational waves on the other hand hand are extremely aloof. So I'll give you a nice analogy to think about this. Imagine you go to a party. And you go to the party with an, an, an extrovert and you say you're ready to go. Now, by the time you and your friend leave, it could be an hour because everybody they meet uh, on their way to the door, they stop, they chat, and it takes you a long time to make your way out of the room. And that's photons. They interact with matter. And as a result, in the early universe, they were trapped because they were just bouncing between all the electrons and, and particles and, then, and they didn't escape. Gravitational waves, on the other hand, are just like going to the party with an, an introvert. You, you say, I'm ready to go, and they make a beeline for the door, and they're straight out. They, you know, and, and so gravitational waves have been streaming towards us from the very beginning of, 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 of uh, after the Big Bang, whereas the photons were actually trapped by the matter. And those and they, photons couldn't escape till the universe had expanded enough that the that they had the, the, the electrons were spaced far enough about that the light could kind of make it out and that was when the universe was 400,000 years old so if you want to look at the universe at any time earlier than 400,000 year, years you have to use something other than light and turns out gravitational waves so that's really exciting you would want to be able to see a cosmic background of of gravitational waves. And if LIGO were sensitive enough, the gravitational waves that we would see would be in, in the LIGO band would, would be from when the universe was 10 to the minus 22 seconds old. All right. So so if you really want to see the beginning, this is your this is this is what you're gonna have to do. Now it turns out that the the, the signal is very weak. So LIGO in its it, it, in its current form is about it needs a sensitivity of a factor of a million better to see those you know if you assume sort of standard garden variety models of of, of the early universe and the big bang uh, lisa also is not sensitive enough so uh, lisa will see gravitational waves at much lower frequencies so it's a little bit like if you compare ligo and lisa the way you should compare them is if ligo is a a a, a 
a visible telescope. LISA is a radio telescope, so much longer wavelengths, but it sees different sources. LISA sees supermassive black holes. But the gravitational wave, the primordial gravitational wave background, not yet. Okay. Um, just want to kind of uh, shift gears a, a little bit. We've gotten a question from, uh, from Abigail. Uh, she is a high school student and she wonders if you have any advice uh, for pursuing a career in astrophysics. And just to add on to that, and in particular, do you have any, uh, any advice or encouragement for, for girls entering, entering this field? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say a, a, a few things uh, about that. So I, I think the most important thing, and it's, it, this comes from, you know, is for young people to create, you know, create a, the, the privileged option of doing something you really love to do so that every single day you'll, you'll wake up being excited about it. So if astrophysics excites you, 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 should, you should find a way to do it. Now, what does it mean to find a way to do it? You have to find your, your supporters and your mentors and your champions. Um, you know, look for people who encourage you, look for people who believe in you. Sometimes it's inside your family, sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's you know, the parent of a friend. It's you know, somewhere you're gonna find people who are gonna really support what you wanna do. Um, a career in astrophysics in, typically involves you, you, you wanna you know, speak the language and that means you have to do some math. Um, and um, and um, so I would say always, I think that's the most important thing, find the people who will, who will support what you wanna do. Now, um, and you know, extending that to, to being a, a, a woman in, in, in the sciences and especially in, in, in physics where they are relatively uh, rare, Again, I think the best thing is 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 to to believe in yourself and find people who believe in you, and they're there. You just have to 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 connect. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's another question in here. Um, I get lost the question. <laughs> um. Okay, well, that was that was great. Yeah, at, at um, ah, here we go. So uh, Bonnie Kellerman asks, uh, as the new dean of the School of Science, um, do you, what, what is what is your uh, vision of what you hope to accomplish in this role? What directions would you like to see taken? Uh, yeah, so you know that, that's another great question, Bonnie. So here's here's there's a couple of things. So first, the first thing is, uh, you know, I I've kind of inherited the leadership uh, of you know one of the top schools of science in the world and so my, my first and foremost job is not to screw that up right so uh, and so uh, I'm right now you know early I'm seven weeks into the job I'm, I'm listening carefully to to what I'm hearing from the from the faculty the students the staff and just really trying to understand you know, how to maintain the excellence of the school. So really not to break what's not, what, what works well. Uh, but not everything works well. We, we know across MIT and indeed across, you know, every major un university and indeed across our country, we have huge inequities. We have enormous work to do to make our, our, our education accessible to, to, to more people, to more to, to more diverse uh, people, to be more inclusive, to create an environment where everybody can thrive, and that's real work that has to be done ahead. So I would say, if I could sum it up in in, in two two things, which there's many many more uh, ideas, but the two things: one is to to really maintain our our eminence in science, to always be looking out for for emerging directions to go in, uh, but really to focus also on on issues of, of, of climate and how do we make the school and MIT a more wel welcoming place for everyone. Um, then, uh, so getting, getting back, to, uh, back to the gravitational waves. Um, what is the likelihood that waves from two separate events would reach LIGO and Virgo at the same time and the waves interact? And, would that be scientifically yeah. interesting or, or just cute? 
Bessie. That's, it. That's, it. That's the question. I'm just reading it. I think it would certainly be be cute too. But, yeah. uh, but so there's two 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 things to to say about that. It is certainly uh, possible once you get to an instrument that's that's sensitive enough. Uh, right now, we don't have that happen very often because we're still in the rare event uh, uh, category, right? We're still uh, measuring about one event per week. But imagine you make an instrument that's sensitive enough that now you can start measuring, you know, one event per second, and now these events are coming at you from all different directions. So at that point, you would need uh, you would need uh, better data analysis techniques to separate out these different superpositions of the waveforms, uh, but Lisa, for example, when people think about measuring measurement with Lisa, um, Lisa is actually going to be limited by an astrophysical background. And what that means is Lisa uh, sensitivity will be limited by the fact that Lisa can see uh, the mergers of, of, of white dwarfs. And there's so many of them that you can't resolve them. They just form a, a uniform background hum on top of which all your other signals are going to going to set. So you can you can get into the case where you have so many uh, events happening that they just form a background hum. And and that's the kind of signal you can look for. But LIGO is far from 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 that regime. Okay. Um, I'm start clustering questions. Um, so some questions about uh, what are can you describe some of the improvement some of the improvements that have increased the sensitivity of LIGO and what does it look like going sort of going forward? What is needed? Um, to yeah, continue that. <laughs> yeah. So what? So if you if you could kind of categorize what limits LIGO, there's basically three limiting um, noise sources. So at the lower frequencies, sort of you know, ten hertz to fifty-ish hertz, it's usually limited by mechanical motion of the mirrors in some form or the other, driven by, by, by seismic waves or driven just by, by the, our own control systems and, and that's sort of the low frequency end. Sort of middle frequency is sort of 50 to 150 hertz were actually limited by the thermally driven motion of the mirror. So you rem remember the mirrors are, are, are at a room temperature object, so they have uh, you know they have thermal energy, and just the jitter of that thermal energy is is moving them. And then finally, above about 150 hertz, they are limited by what's called quantum noise, and that is our ability. To, uh, uh, you know, it's basically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle applied to light. So light is made up of photons. Photons must follow the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and so when we make a measurement of the number of photons, we have an uncertainty um, in them that's uh, due to quantum mechanics. And so those are the three uh, typical noise sources. So to make an improvement, for example, the improvement between observing run two and observing run three happened primarily from, from two things. One was we were able to increase the, the laser power. And what that does is it makes that the, the, our, our photon counting noise better. Remember, the signal scales with the number of photons we use in the measurement, but the noise, because it's Poisson, scales as the square root of the number. So your signal to noise ratio improves as the square root of the laser power. So you increase the laser power, you do a square root of two better, the square root of that power increased better. That was one piece of it, but the biggest piece of it, the bigger piece of it came from using a, a quantum technology where we take the light, but I told you, light ha it has to uh, uh, is has an uh, has an uncertainty principle associated with it. So what's the uncertainty principle? Actually, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll I'll show you a picture because that will 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 kind of clarify uh, uh, what it is. Give me just a a, a, a second. I'm gonna uh, go back uh, a couple of slides. Uh, it's a picture that I I actually. Uh, oh no, come on. Oh, let me get there. I missed one thing I want to show. Here we go. All right. So, uh, so here is uh, the the thing that we do. So, what we do is so look at the picture on the right over here. This is a light wave. 
This is just showing you the electric field as a function of time. And the black line is what a classical field would be. And now it's grayed out in a band because of quantum uh, fluctuations. So quantum, quantum mechanics tells us that you must have an uncertainty. And that's what this uncertainty tells you. So what we do is the top picture is equal uncertainty in amplitude and in phase of the light. And that's what ordinary laser light does. Its quantum properties are that it has equal uncertainty in amplitude and phase. But now look at the next two pictures. You can engineer special quantum states of light where you can make the amplitude extremely certain. Look, you can see exactly where this is crossing, uh, you know, where, where the amplitude is. But look at the phase. The phase becomes completely uncertain. Or look at the bottom picture where the amplitude is totally uncertain. You don't know where exactly the peak is, but you can see the zero crossing very, very precisely. And these are called squeeze states of light where you can squeeze the noise from amplitude into phase or vice versa. And that's what we, that's one of the technologies we use to get to this, this improvement in, in sensitivity. Um, so these are these specially uh, uh, engineered quantum states of light. And so that's essentially, um, uh, you know, um, uh, one of the technology, one of the major technologies that we've used recently to make the improvement. Um, I think we're, we're coming up on, uh, on 8.30, but we have gotten a bunch of questions about uh, what are the possibilities of using using LIGO and the uh, and related instruments for uh, for phenomenon for uh, involving dark matter and dark energy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a a, a good question with a rather dis, uh, disappointing answer. Um, so most of the dark matter that we we know from other observations is very diffusely distributed. It's distributed as a diffuse cloud of matter across in, in, in galaxies. And so, and, and, and LIGO in particular is, is, is tailored for looking at very compact objects. So very, you know, compact uh, uh, distributions of, of gravitational mass. And so it turns out that other than using you can have ideas like you can use a black hole. If a black hole is sitting in a, in a cloud of dark matter, you can use the black hole as a tracer to, to observe the properties of dark matter. So by looking at the dynamics of the black holes, you might be able to say something about the, the, the dark matter. But directly detecting the dark matter itself, it's, it's, it's not the right instrument because it's the distributions are just too diffuse. There's still a lot of, a lot of questions here. I'm sorry. I just I don't think we can we can uh, get to get to all of them. Um, uh, uh, so what does this? Um, yeah, quickly. What uh, what if anything does this tell us about the beginnings of the universe? Yeah. Uh, I so I I think we have not yet made detections or seen things that directly relate to the beginnings of the universe because the primordial the primordial gravitational wave background signal i told you is just too weak we don't see that um, we are looking for objects called primordial black holes which are you know the idea that in the early universe from the vacuum fluctuations uh, the first uh, objects to form gravitationally might have been these small microscale you know, primordial black holes. So there are some ideas for, for looking for those, and we, we do, uh, but we haven't seen anything that as yet points to, to, to things in the early universe. Uh, it, one of the things that I haven't talked about is being able to look at objects that aren't things we already expected, like neutron stars and black hole mergers we expected, right? Already from the 1960s and 70s, we thought they should be there. We'd never seen them but we thought they should be there. But then there's the question of, will we see things that we didn't even expect to be there? And that's really, uh, I think, uh, the mo one of the most exciting potentials for sort of turning on this new way of observing. We've got a couple of, couple of questions. Um, are there plans for uh, 
you know, a space LIGO or space LISA? Yeah, so LISA is a space LIGO. Yeah. And LISA ha is, uh, is basically a, 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 real, uh, a real project. It has, you know, it has been under development by, from, by the European Space Agency and NASA uh, for a couple of decades now. And it went through a, 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 a rough patch of cancellation, but it's in the last few years, three or four years, not surprisingly, uh, it is very much uh, back on, you know, uh, in, in production, if you will. It has a launch date of 2034. Okay, 20, 2034. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's probably about all we really uh, have time for. So, um, like to thank you again and uh, just encourage people who still have uh, have questions that they want to just uh, maybe look on, you know, maybe to reach out um, to you or to, or to your group. Um, and um, yeah, look forward to the next, uh, <laughs> next thing. And, yeah, and very, uh, and excited to see about what, um, you know, what's, yeah, what's in store for uh, for LIGO, for the physics department, and uh, for the MIT School of Science? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone uh, for 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 being here. It's 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 really great to share share you know great to discovery with everyone. So thank you.